man, there is just something magical about the Christmas season. Anybody excited about Christmas? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, just a few of you. Okay. You know, if I ask the kids that, they like shout us down, right? You know that. There's something magical about the Christmas season and uh, something about, uh, you know, just that, that season, especially when you're a kid, you know, like, because life's a whole lot less complicated when you're a kid. Isn't that right? I mean, the big jolly red guy in a red, you know, the, red, the guy that shows up in a red suit, he's not a red guy, but he shows up in a red suit, right? And that guy shows up and just leaves all these gifts under the tree. It's awesome, you know? But uh, don't you wish life was on that uncomplicated? Well, I, I'm excited. My kids, actually, my kids start coming home this week. So I've got one coming on Thursday night from New York City. I've got another one coming next uh, Sunday night at midnight from the Middle East. Yeah, a week away. So, uh, and then we have one in town that we don't know if we're going to see her or not. So she's staying in the dorm. Who knows? It's just, what can I say? But uh, there is something magical about the Christmas season. And honestly, my hope, as we're in a little three-week series or four weeks if you include Christmas Eve, uh, my hope for each one of us during this season is that you and I would be re-enchanted with Christmas and specifically that we'd be re-enchanted with Jesus. You know, sometimes life can rob us of that kind of magical feeling, right? That sense of just enchantment and wonder. And, and what we're doing, uh, we're actually, in fact, the kids just sang about it. I didn't know that that was the song they were going to sing. Um, but they're, we have a really smart children's ministry, and they probably looked at what we were doing for Christmas and said, let's pick a song that goes with that, right? But we're actually unpacking a little verse um, that helps us to better understand who Jesus really is. In fact, what we recognize is that Christmas, the first Christmas, was really Jesus coming to reintroduce God to humanity. You see, thousands of years of human history, they had lost sight of who God really was, who God really is, how God really cared, the wisdom that God would provide, the fact that God would actually want to be with people, be in the midst of people, even in the middle of our mess. And so Christmas is really Jesus reintroducing God to humanity. And so when we come to this season of the year, we, those of us who are followers of Jesus, and maybe those of us who are exploring faith for the very first time, we ought to treat it as a season, an opportunity for us to be re-enchanted with the wonder, not just of Christmas and, and the season with all of the trappings and all of the wonderful things that we get to enjoy together, but we ought to treat it as a season where we get to re-engage with God. We get to look afresh at who God really is. And so we've been taking a look at this verse, and Pastor Aaron uh, kicked off the series here last week, and I kicked it off in Sandy. And we're taking a look at one verse, looking at four specific titles that God speaks or gives about his son, Jesus. But what I, what I want to do this morning is I want to help us understand the backdrop of this little verse that the kids just sang about and the, the, this little verse that we're taking a look at over the next few weeks. Uh, we're looking at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, and we just sang about it, right? Unto us a child is given, and a, 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 or sorry, a child is born, and a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and then he uses these four titles. But what was going on when that verse was spoken? What was going on in history at that particular time? And I think if we could understand a little bit of the background of this verse, it might help us better understand who God really is. And what was taking place here, and I know that um, Aaron uh, touched on this a little bit, because this was a pretty dark season, a pretty glo gloomy season for the children of Israel and the children of Judah. And actually what had happened was that Israel had split. They had a, a war, a civil war, and, and so there's this like the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and then the southern kingdom, which is Judah. And Judah had a new king. His name was Ahaz. And Ahaz comes to the throne, and Ahaz comes to the throne not as a godly man, not as a man whose life is submitted to God, wanting God's input. No, Ahaz comes to the throne as a corrupt man. In fact, Ahaz is so bad that he actually sacrifices his own kids to idols. This is a corrupt man. This is not a man, the kind of guy that you want to be around. Well, Ahaz, um, as he comes to the throne, um, very quickly he finds his, his capital city, Jerusalem, and the nation of Judah besieged by actually not one, but two enemies. And the Assyrians would be like the superpower of the Middle East back then. And so they're approaching from the east. They're attacking. They're, they're just kind of swallowing up all of the tribes and kingdoms and nations that are in their path. And they're, going to, they're about to take over Judah. 
Well, the nations around Judah, in fact, the nations to the north of Judah, one of them being Israel, they form an alliance, the Israelites, the Aramites, the Ephraimites. And, and so they form this alliance. They're trying to get stronger so that somehow, some way, they might be able to save themselves and resist this Assyrian army that's advancing on Judah. Guess who's stuck in the middle? Judah. Ahaz. Imagine coming to the throne, uh, you know, you're a new king, and you're not exactly the best king, um, but you now have two enemies that are pressing against you. What's Ahaz supposed to do? Where does he turn? Because he's trapped, he's a rock uh, caught in a hard place, trapped between two enemies. Well, Ahaz thinks to himself, well, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and I've already had a battle with the Israelites we're not friends with them anymore, so guess what? I'll become a friend of the Assyrians. But, but right before he steps in and makes, that, makes this agreement or this covenant or this kind of agreement with the Assyrians, God steps into the picture. And in Isaiah chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 4, God says this to, uh, to Ahaz. He says, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. In the midst of this difficult situation, in the midst of this like, man, I'm going to be crushed between these two warring factions, between these two nations, between these two enemies, these two kingdoms, God steps into the middle of this space and he offers Ahaz something better. He says, don't be afraid. Keep calm. Trust me. I have a way out of this situation. Well, as you know, Maybe, you, well, you know because you've read the Bible and you've read this part of it. Ahaz, in this moment, this offer from God, offers him something better, offers him a way out. Ahaz turns his back on God and makes an agreement or a covenant with the Assyrians. He effectively becomes a vassal king. He's subservient to this enemy nation. He's, he's got to do whatever now they tell him to do. He's led his people through corruption into enslavement and on into destruction. And it's in the middle of this story. Can you imagine being a citizen of the kingdom of Judah? Man, you're now enslaved to a foreign nation. Your king is corrupt. Your king has turned his back on God. And you can understand why Isaiah says, man, these are gloomy days. These are dark days. These are days without light. And, and, and you've got to understand that Ahaz has turned his back on God. God has offered him a helping hand. God, God has offered him something better. God has offered him a way out, and Ahaz turns his back on God. But this is what's so amazing about God. There's a verse in the New Testament that says this, even when we are unfaithful, God remains faithful. And it's in the midst of this darkness, it's in the midst of this angst, it's in the midst of this corruption and destruction and Ahaz and Judah turning their back on God that God speaks these words. And they're words that are just filled with hope. They're words that are designed to help us to understand who God is. And I don't know who you are and I don't know where you are and I don't know what your circumstance is, but you might find yourself in a situation where God, is there a way out of this thing? Lord, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And oftentimes, if you're like me, you know, it's like, man, I just got to figure this out myself. But the message of Christmas and the hope that we ought to draw, even from the title that we're going to take a look at today, is that God is not distant. God is not disconnected. God isn't someone who doesn't care. God remains faithful. God is the one who comes after us, even when we are trying to do it in our own strength. And this is exactly what God's doing in this verse. And this is what it says. It says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we've sung it, we've read it, but it says this, for to us a child is born. Now think about the people that this is being written to. This is a people who are, who are besieged, they're under attack, they're being conquered by an enemy. And God speaks these words and says this, for unto us a child is born. God, I'm not exactly looking for a child. I'd like prefer a superhero. Like maybe Captain America or Superman, right? Or Batman. Like somebody to come and rescue us. But God says, nope, I'm sending you a child. I'm like, could you send somebody with a cape? 
Even somebody that would wear their underwear outside of their pants. I mean, we need a superhero. And God said, nope, I'm sending you a child. And God's wanting us to understand something here. Because God's always wanting us to understand that our weakness, our, sorry, our greatest strength doesn't even begin to compare to his weakest weakness, if I could say it that way. God wants us to understand that his weakness is better and greater than our greatest strength. And so he sends a child to remind us. What he also wants us to understand is that, that for unto us a child is born. That Jesus who would come would be fully human. A child that is born. But he goes on and he says, and a son is given. In other words, the father is giving his son. Do you see what the author is wanting us to understand? That Jesus is going to be fully human, but fully God. And so this person, Jesus, who would come, says that the government shall be upon his shoulders. In other words, all authority, everything being as it's meant to be, will rest upon his shoulders. And then he gives us these titles. And he says, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And what God is wanting us to understand about his son is that his son brings us divine wisdom, that God still speaks to us. God wants us to understand that he protects us. God wants us to understand through Jesus that God loves us and cares for us. That's why he has this title of everlasting father. And God also wants us to understand that he's the prince of peace, divine tranquility, that he's the one that calms us and leads us and guides us. And so it's through these four titles that Jesus, or God wants us to understand who his son is. And Christmas is about us being re-enchanted with Jesus. And so today, what I want to do is I want to take a look at the first title, which is Wonderful Counselor. Now, we're in church, so you have to be honest. How many of you have been to a counselor? And that's not a bad thing. I got both my hands raised. Got my hands in the air like I just don't care, right? <clears throat> I, I go, I've been to a counselor, and I go to a counselor. It keeps me sane, right? And, I, and my wife goes, thank God he goes to a counselor, right? <clears throat> but but um, you may have not been to a counselor. Maybe you've, been to a, uh, maybe you've been to a family counselor or maybe a marriage counselor or a financial counselor, right? There's all kinds of professional counselors out there. And I'm so grateful for those who have wisdom. But, but maybe you've not been to a professional counselor, but maybe you have someone or a few people in your life, like an aunt or an uncle or a parent or a, an older friend, a neighbor, someone that, man, they just seem to be, they kind of play that role in your life. They're just there. They just know how to listen. They know how to ask some questions. They're able to put their hand around your shoulder and just kind of point you in the right direction. And I'm, I'm grateful for those kind of people in my life. I know when we were, uh, when my kids were younger, uh, and Walter Madison's still a great friend of mine. We still, in fact, he lives in Happy Valley, so we hang out. And, uh, but I remember when my kids were younger, in fact, my, my middle one, she's the crazy one that's like in the Middle East and all over the world. Like, like she's either going to be president or I don't know what she's going to do, but she's like, she sets her, you know, she's going to go. And uh, when, when she was younger, I remember it was probably, I don't know, three, four years old, I remember um, Walter pulling me aside and saying, hey, you know, great young girl, but um, if you don't get that strong will under control and submitted, you're going to have some real problems when you get older, you know? And I'm grateful for the wisdom and the counsel and the advice that I got from Walter back during that time because I've, it gave me the opportunity to make a couple little tweaks and course adjustments and Jenny and I to kind of raise Sophie a particular way. And now she's not a woman with a strong will. She's a woman with a deep conviction. And I'm just grateful that God puts people like that in our lives. I was looking up kind of a definition of, of a counselor. And a, a counselor is a person of wisdom who listens to you, who understands you, who empathizes with you with their quiet, wise counsel. They hold up a mirror to help you see who you really are, to help you see your blind spots. And that's really true, isn't it? That if you have someone in your life, or maybe it's a professional counselor that you've been with, I get impatient with counselors sometimes. I get impatient with my counselor sometimes because I just want them to tell me what to do. Can you just give me the answer and tell me what to do, right? Anybody else impatient that way, right? 
But a wise counselor holds up a mirror. They ask you questions. They listen. They empathize. And as they ask you questions, you begin to realize, oh, that's why I act the way that I act. Oh, that's the, way, that's the reason why I think that way. And it gives me the opportunity or it gives you or us the opportunity to actually go in and start making some of those tweaks, some of those changes. A good counselor listens. A good counselor asks questions, right, that actually help you get to the root of the issue. And, and what Jesus is saying here, because, and because how many of you know, and uh, get your finger, everyone get your little index finger out. You got it? Wiggle it at me right there. Okay. Now point at yourself and go, I'm the issue. I'm the issue. 99% of the time, I'm the issue, right? Well, we're a mess, right? There's often times we don't know like Ahaz, man, I, we got into this trouble and I don't know how to get out of it. And a good counselor comes along and helps you to understand who you are and helps to lead you from that place. And, and in many respects, a counselor is this outside of us, mind or heart, that feeds us just gently uttered wisdom, right? It's objective, and it helps us to see who we are. And, and so God in this verse is saying, my son Jesus isn't just a counselor. In fact, what we're going to discover is he's not just a wonderful counselor, like, oh, he's so wonderful, right? There's actually a whole lot of deeper meaning there. And, and the question that I want to answer this morning is, well, then what kind of counselor is God? And what we have to be careful of in the world in which we live is that sometimes we can make therapy and counsel, and I'm not putting those things down. I'm so grateful for them. But God is so much more than a therapist. Jesus is so much more than a good psychologist. Jesus is so much more than, man, I can help you understand yourself. But reality is Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves, right? But Jesus is so much more than that. It says that Jesus is a counselor, a wonderful counselor. And, and to read it in English, you know, we can kind of go down this path of, oh, that's what that means. And we could think of a counselor or we could think of that person who's been a counselor, even just a friend in our life who's given us wisdom. But this idea of counsel in the Hebrew mind is so much more. In fact, um, Ahaz, in fact, kings, ancient kings, would have had what you would have called royal counselors. And a royal counselor, you see, ancient kings were always getting themselves in trouble, right? They, I mean, you just, we just read about Ahaz, right? We just unpacked that whole story that Ahaz got himself in trouble, got the nation in trouble, led them into captivity, right? Like they were now enslaved to the Assyrians. And so the, the, the kings of that day were always getting themselves in trouble. And so they would have royal counselors who were always present in the royal court. The royal counselor was aware of everything that was going on. The royal counselor understood the thinking of the king, understood the circumstances that were going on around him. And all I want you to hear, all I want you to know is that this royal counselor, this idea of a royal counselor isn't someone that was outside of the royal court. It was someone who lived right there. It was someone who was intimately acquainted with every detail and everything that was going on. And what I think God is wanting us to understand is that you have in Jesus a royal counselor. God is wanting us to understand that you have someone who is present with you in the midst of the mess. You have someone who's, who, who's intimately acquainted with every detail of your life. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. How many of you know that God is omnipresent? He's omniscient, meaning that he knows and sees everything. And yet sometimes I try to hide things from God. That's the most ridiculous thing, isn't it? You have a God who sees everything, and yet we try to hide things from him. And all I'm wanting you to see this morning is that God is an ever-present help. God describes his son Jesus 
not as just a therapist or a psychologist. He describes him as a royal counselor, someone who's in the midst of the mess, someone who understood or understands everything that was going on. And just like the kings in, 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 ancient, in antiquity would have had royal counsel that would have been aware of everything that's going on, God's wanting us to understand that in the middle of your mess, God understands everything that's going on. That God is not distant and disconnected, but that God is intimately acquainted with you, with your thinking, with your, your attitudes, with your fears, with your desires. God's intimately acquainted with all of who you are. And so when he says a child is born and a son is given and he will be a wonderful counselor, he's the royal counselor that's present with you. Ahaz chose to turn his back on the counsel of God and it led to destruction. But what Jesus offers us is the opportunity to turn ourselves toward him, to move toward him, understanding that he knows you better than you know yourself and he's present with you in the middle of the mess. But the second thing we understand is this idea that Jesus is, and it's this word, wonderful. Now, in the English language, the word wonderful is an adjective. Now, I'm not, um, I, I can barely speak. English is my first language, right? So I'm going to try to teach you some English right now. I'm not an English teacher, and I can barely speak English myself. In fact, funny story from quite a few years ago. It was probably 15 or so years ago. I was teaching a membership class. Um, it was a 12-week membership class. It was at a church. And so I show up for the first class, and I teach. And this gentleman comes up to me afterwards, uh, and he goes, man, that was really, really wonderful. It's obvious that English is your second language, and you did a really good job. <laughs> I was like, wow. And I didn't, I didn't have the... You know, the guts to tell him that English is actually my only language, you know. But, you know, <laughs> okay, thanks for the encouragement, you know. But in the English language, an adjective is something that describes something else. It describes an object. It describes a person. It describes a place. But what the Hebrew here is actually not an adjective. It's actually a noun, meaning that Jesus actually is the thing. He's not, it's not a word to describe the thing. He is the thing. And, and, and the idea behind this word wonderful is full of wonder, incomprehensible, unfathomable. It literally means beyond human, something better than anything that exists. In fact, it's the same Hebrew word that's used throughout Exodus and the Psalms to describe how God interacted with the children of Israel to perform miracles that delivered them from slavery. And, and so God is saying this now about his son. That he's, what he's saying is you don't just have a royal counselor who is present with you and clearly understands everything about you. You actually have a wonderful counselor. Not one who's just present, but one who performs wonders, miracles in your midst to rescue you. In fact, let me give you kind of a couple of illustrations. It would be a little bit like, do we have anybody in the fire department? Anybody? No, we, had a, we do. We have a few here. Kevin, you're not in the fire department. <laughs> My goodness. Anyway, we had a couple in the first service, so I only ask just in case I offend them, okay? But the fire department, can you imagine the Clackamas Fire Department, right? And the Clackamas Fire Department, their job is just to warn you or teach you how to rightly handle fire, right? And so... That's their exclusive role. And so all that they do with their fire trucks, they drive around with a loudspeaker, just shouting out instructions on how to properly handle fire. They leave leaflets in your mailbox, right? Maybe they shoot you an email. All of their social media feed is all about how to rightly handle fire, which is wonderful until you have a fire in your kitchen. Can you imagine having a fire in your kitchen and you, you pick up your phone and you dial 911, right? And you're like guys, I've got a fire in my kitchen. And they go, well, that's not our problem. Our job was just to teach you how to rightly handle fire. And you're obviously not rightly handling fire. <laughs> Let me give you another illustration. It's a little bit like this. Can you imagine being on the beach in Hawaii? Yes. <laughs> how many of you would like to be on a beach in Hawaii right now? Come on. I'm tired of the rain. Anybody else, right? 
So here you are, you can even close your eyes. Can you feel the breeze? Oh my gosh, can you smell the coconuts? And the... Anyway, so here you are on the beach in Hawaii, right? And on the beach, there's a lifeguard. And the lifeguard, he has this bullhorn, and he's just telling you how to swim, right? He's telling you, hey, be careful of the rip current over there. I don't want you getting sucked in or sucked out, right? And so that's his job. And so then all of a sudden, you realize, my goodness, there's somebody over there, and they're drowning, and so you're screaming at the lifeguard. You're like, look, there's somebody drowning over here. And the lifeguard's just like, hey, that's not my fault. I mean, I told him how to swim. I told him to avoid the rip current, right? No, no, no. The job of the lifeguard, what is that? It's to get in the water. It's not to stand on the shoreline. The job of the fire department isn't to just bark out instructions. It's to enter into the middle of the mess. It's to get into the fire and help do something about it. Well, this is exactly what God is wanting us to understand about his son. You see, sometimes we treat Christianity like Christianity is about a set of do's and don'ts. This is the way you gotta live, you know? You gotta do these things, you gotta hang out with these kinds of people, you gotta avoid these things, and you gotta avoid those kind of people that do those kinds of things, right? And sometimes, inside and outside of the church, we've reduced Christianity to this kind of right and wrong way of living. But that's not at all what the gospel is. That's not at all what Christianity is. Religion gives you a counselor who barks out instructions and says, hey, this is the right thing you gotta do. Don't do that, avoid this. But the gospel or Christianity is a wonder-working, intervening rescuer named Jesus. Someone who's willing to jump in to rescue us. Someone who's willing to step into the middle of the mess to help us. Religion says, stop being a baby, grow up, just stop it. Any of you ever seen the Bob Newhart? Uh, uh, I thought it was SNL, but somebody corrected me uh, the other day. But you know that little skit where Bob Newhart is listening? I can't even remember who the other actor was, but he's listening, and, and, uh, and it's a counseling session. I should have shown it, actually. It's hilarious. But you know, he's like, he's like doing this like little kind of counseling session, and Bob Newhart's just listening and listening and listening, and then he finally goes, stop it, stop it. And some people think Christianity is a little bit like that. That Christianity uh, just says, stop being a baby. Stop behaving that way. Grow up. you got to stop doing those kinds of things. But that's not at all what Christianity is. That's what religion is. The gospel tells us that God is going to send us a baby, a baby who will grow up and live the life that we couldn't live. And ultimately, he would be the one that would come and rescue us. Religion points the finger at you. Get it together. This is how you should live. But the gospel points the finger at the manger. Why? Because God, his son Jesus, is a wonderful counselor. Someone who's acquainted with you, deeply acquainted with you, knows all of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly in your life. But God doesn't stand at a distance pointing his finger, telling you to fix it. He sends his son Jesus to step into the middle of the mess and to walk with you, guiding you, leading you, rescuing you, and ultimately leading you to a life of flourishing. And so where Ahaz turned his back on the counsel of God, Jesus is sent by his father to give us another opportunity, not to turn our back, but to turn ourselves towards him, understanding that he's in the middle of the mess with us. It's a little bit like this. You go to a financial counselor, and uh, maybe you've been in this situation where you go to a financial counselor, and man, I'm in debt, or you take a Dave Ramsey class, you know, those, uh, and, and it's like, man, I want to get out of debt, but, but it's $300,000 worth of debt. And, and you go to the counselor with the expectation that, man, maybe the counselor will give me some advice. Maybe the counselor will give me some guidance. Maybe the counselor will give me some principles. And so the guy, you know, the counselor, guy, girl sits down and, and gives you some good advice. You know, hey, let's attack this debt first. And once we've got that one, you're starting to feel a little bit better and you add, compound and add more money. Let's knock this debt down and this debt down. And, and ultimately you're looking at it going, man, this is probably like a 10-year journey. This might take me the rest of my life, but, but man, it's good counsel. But can you imagine going to a financial counselor and he sits down or she sits down with you. And yes, they give you some advice. They say, hey, listen, I want to help you live the kind of life that you're designed for. I want you to live a life that's free from debt. And so here's some principles. Here's some guidance. But then he takes out his checkbook. 
and he writes a $300,000 check. And he says, I want to take you out of debt, and I want you to trust me to help you live a debt-free life. This is exactly what Jesus, our wonderful counselor, has done for us. And, then, and, we, and that might sound really abstract, and if you've been around church for a long time, you might go, man, I get it, you know, isn't God wonderful? Isn't Jesus wonderful? He's forgiven me of my sins. And that kind of might feel a little bit abstract and a little bit distant. But I want, to think, I want you to think about what are some difficult circumstances that you find yourself in right now? What are some hard things going on in your life? What are some areas where maybe you're feeling overwhelmed or defeated or, or, or a sense of, man, I'm just discouraged or depressed or I feel this weight just on me? I don't know what that circumstance is for you, but I'm here to tell you that as we re-engage with who God is through his son, Jesus, that Jesus comes to us as a wonderful counselor, that Jesus comes to us to lift the burden. Jesus isn't standing on the shoreline of your life barking out instructions going, I told you so. You got yourself into that kind of trouble, didn't you? No, no, no. The royal counselor is present with you in the middle of the mess, but he's not just present with you to, to comfort you and to empathize with you. He's present with you to rescue you. And just like he comes to Ahaz and he says, I got some counsel for you. I've got some wisdom for you. I want you to know that I'm with you. I want you to keep calm. Don't be afraid. Trust me. I can lead you from this place. Ultimately, Ahaz would turn his back on him. But Jesus, I believe Jesus, he's right here, right now, with you. I don't know what the circumstance is. I don't know what the difficulty, the hardship, the challenge. It's going to be different probably for all of us. For some of us, man, we're on the top of the mountain right now and things are great. For others of us, man, I don't know how I'm going to get out of bed tomorrow. I don't know how I'm going to face this Christmas season. Man, I, how am I going to step into 2023? Because there's a burden, there's a weight, there's a difficulty, there's a challenge. And this Christmas, God's saying, I sent you a wonderful counselor. His name is Jesus. There's another name that's used of Jesus. You're very familiar with it. We talk about it this time of the year. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So I want you just to close your eyes this morning. Just as we close, we're gonna sing a song in a moment and close the service together, but I don't want to move too quickly past the moment. I don't want to rush past this moment where God, I think, wants to encounter you where you're at. It might be, man, I've, I've never thought that, never thought of Jesus that way. Never thought that he would be the one that actually steps into the middle of my mess and wants to rescue me. a conversation with a guy in between services and he was just sharing with me, man, I've, I've just faced some, some hardship, some difficulty, some challenge and this week, man, just this week it was like I, I just turned around and I was just like, I'm going to walk towards God, not away from him because that's who Jesus is. So Jesus is present with you. I don't know what the difficulty is. I don't know what the challenge is. I don't know what the hardship is, but God is with you. So Lord, we, just as we close this morning, Lord Jesus, we don't want to come in and sing and watch our kids and then run out, Lord Jesus. We don't want to, we want to respond, Lord Jesus, to your word. We want to respond to your presence with us. And Father, I pray for us this morning that Lord, whatever that burden is, whatever that hardship is, whatever, Lord, that difficulty, that circumstance, Lord, that thing that just stares us in the face and causes us to shrink back, Lord Jesus, I pray that right now, Lord, the truth of the fact that you are present with us as a wonderful 
counselor. Lord, would supersede and override, Lord, whatever that is. And so, Lord, would you, even as we sing this song, Lord, would you reveal yourself to us, Lord, as our wonderful counselor.